Today we're gonna discuss how you should proceed when you raise before the flop and then miss the flop. The spot that comes up all the time in poker and we are going to cover it today for you. Here's a question from a YouTube commenter. I have a difficult time knowing what I should do when I raise pre-flop, get called, and then miss the flop. How should I proceed? Help! All right then, the answer is it depends. And it depends on multiple factors. First, it depends on your range. How does the rest of your range connect with the board? Because realize you are not playing your own individual hand. You are playing your range and you're playing your range against your opponent's range on this particular board, right? Some boards are gonna connect way better with your range than your opponent's range. And that's gonna let you bet with your entire range, which includes all your garbage when you miss. Some range or some boards are going to be way better for your opponent's range than for yours, which means you're going to be doing a whole lot of checking, usually with your garbage. Also, your position is very important. As you are in position, you should be betting way more often. And when you're out of position, you should be checking way more often. Your stack depth is also important. Also, your opponent's tendencies. We're going to discuss that as well. And the number of players in the pot. As you're against more and more players, you must do a lot more checking because someone is likely to have something. Very, very important to ask yourself. Do you have the range and or nut advantage? I discussed this thoroughly in the cash game and tournament master classes at pokercoaching.com. These ideas heavily influence when you should bet and how much you should bet. Typically, if you have a sizable range advantage, usually with your range having 55% equity or more against your opponent's range, you should be betting pretty frequently. And as your range advantage gets higher and higher and higher, you should often, not always, but often bet more and more often. And when you do not have the range advantage, meaning you don't have more than, let's say, 55% equity with your whole range against your opponent's whole range, you should be doing a whole lot of checking especially with your hands that have little or no equity and little or no chance to actually improve. Also, when you have a lot of effective nut hands in your range, hands that are just happy playing for a lot of money, you should bet more and more frequently, even when you miss the flop, because your opponent can't check raise all that aggressively because they're gonna be check raising into hands that they're drawing dead against, right? And it's fine to bet even with somewhat junky draws, let's say with like one overcard, if you know you're not getting raised all that often, because when you spike that one overcard for top pair, you often win. And sometimes those hands become good bluffing hands as well. And when you don't have as many bluff hand or as many nut hands in your range, you have to check more often. So there are some spots where you actually have a higher range advantage, but you completely lack the nut advantage. And those are spots where you have to check. An obvious example of this is, let's say you raise from under the gun and the big blind calls and the flop comes jack, six, six, okay? You have almost no sixes in your under the gun range, but the big blind defender is going to have a lot of sixes. However, you have a whole lot of over pairs and they don't. And they have a whole lot of unpaired hands that have almost no equity and you have stuff like ace high, which is actually okay on jack, six, six. So this is a spot where you don't actually get to bet every time in a lot of scenarios, even though your range advantage is very high, because you completely lack the nut advantage because the best hands in your range, like pocket aces, or maybe not pocket jacks, but you know, pocket aces or ace jack on jack six six are crushed by your opponent's reasonable nut hands, like a random six, right? So that's the spot where you'll actually have pretty high equity, but you won't actually bet all that often. You'll bet pretty often, but not every single time. Also, typically as you have the range advantage, but you completely lack the nut advantage, those are times you usually bet tiny. And on that jack six six board, the correct continuation bet size, especially if you're playing medium or short stacked, is one big blind. Most people do that wrong. Bonus content for all of you today. Maybe we'll make a video on when you should be betting tiny in the future. I don't know. If you want to see a video for when you should be betting tiny in the future, do me a favor, click the like and subscribe button below. Let me know in the comment section as well. If you have any other ideas for topics for these videos, let me know. I've studied poker a lot. I can talk about a lot of things pertaining to poker. So I want to give you exactly what you want. Also, your position is very important. You should check more often from out of position. Making a small bet with a wide range of junk that has any potential to improve from in position is usually fine. That's gonna be like random over cards. It's okay to bet with just total junk that has a little bit of equity, but it's not really gonna win all that often. Also, it is fine 
from out of position to bet with those junky hands as long as your opponent will react straightforwardly. How in the world does it think this is not correct English? It is also fine from out of position if your opponent will react straightforwardly. You know what? I will side with PowerPoint on this one. I think they're actually right. I failed at grammar. I wrote all these books, but I failed at grammar today. I apologize for this. If you like my lack of grammar, click the like button too. I need a little bit of uh, positive reinforcement right now. So anyway, it's fine to check from out of position, or it's fine to bet with these junky hands from out of position too if your opponent's not gonna raise all that often. The worst thing that can happen to you when you bet from out of position is for you to get raised because then you're in this really rough spot where you're gonna have a really tough time realizing your equity with a lot of hands. So as your opponent's gonna raise more often from in position, you want to be betting way, way, way less often in general, especially with your garbage. Stack depth. As you get shorter and shorter stack, it becomes more costly to lose a continuation bet. Also, with short stacks, your junky draws like random overcard or gut shots are not getting good implied odds. Like imagine you're 100 big blinds deep and you bet with a gut shot and you spike the gut shot straight draw. Now you can blast the turn and blast the river and win 40 more big blinds, right? But if you're only playing 20 big blinds deep, well, you can only win 20 big blinds, right? So you're going to find that as you get shallower and shallower stacked, you should give up a little bit more with your total junk, especially when you think a continuation bet is likely to fail, usually because the board's pretty good for your opponent's range or because you are out of position. Your opponent's tendencies are clearly very, very important. You do not want to bluff as often, in general, against calling stations and maniacs. Calling stations just aren't going to fold. Maniacs are more inclined to raise, right? Those are the things you don't really want to have happen when you are betting with garbage. You're going to want to be bluffing more often against weak, straightforward players who are just going to fold a little bit too much. If your opponents fold a little bit too much, you are going to crush them by betting with everything. This is what I wrote about in my first tournament book long ago. Just continuation bet a lot. That doesn't necessarily work today because people have realized you can't drastically overfold and just wait for the nuts. It doesn't work. But if you are against somebody who is still playing like it's uh, 20, 2020, like it's 2003, then, uh, you know, raise, raise a lot in continuation, bet a lot and win in a lot of small and medium pots with no contest. The number of opponents you're against is very important. Bluff less often into multiple opponents, period. Okay. And against many opponents, you should be betting very polarized. You should only be betting with your best made hands and with your draws. And even then, there are some boards where you should be checking with pretty much your entire range. Let's say you raise from early position and the hijack and the button call and the flop comes 10-7-5. That's a board where you probably want to check with everything because this board is really bad for you and it's okay for your opponents. If the big blind calls as well, it's even worse. So this is a spot where you wanna be doing a ton of checking. All right, let's take a look at some examples. Do you all like examples? Follow along and ask yourself what you would do with junk. You raise from under the gun and the big blind calls. Flop comes ace, king, queen. If you disagree with any of these, let me know in the comment section, I'll consider it. We'll run some GTO strategies maybe. All right, on ace, king, queen, this is a spot where you should be betting for a medium or big size with your entire range because you have the range advantage and you have the nut advantage. So if you did raise with the 8-7 suited, this is still a board where you're going to be betting. Because if you think about your opponent's range, they're going to have a lot of unpaired undercards and they're going to have a lot of queens and kings, which can't really withstand a flop and a turn and a river bet. So this is a spot where we're going to be blasting it. Now, of course, they do have jack-10 in their range. But notice, they don't really have a whole lot of other nut hands. A lot of people 3-bet hands like king-queen and ace king and ace queen and aces kings and queens so really they don't have a whole lot of really good hands and you have aces kings queens ace king ace queen king queen jack 10 you have all these in your range here right maybe not jack 10 offsuit but whatever you have a lot of sets and top two pairs type hands so this is a spot where you're going to want to be betting very frequently usually using a medium or big size and that includes everything this is a great spot to get after it Let's say you raise under the gun and the big blind calls. Flop comes nine, eight, six. Obviously, we're kind of ignoring stack depth here. Let's presume we're medium or deep stack. We're not too shallow. So on nine, eight, six, this is a very, very bad board for under the gun. Because if you think about the under the guns range, they don't really have a whole lot of 10, seven suited, probably none. They do have nines and eights and sixes for sets, but so does the big blind. We may not have stuff like eight, six suited, right? Probably not. We don't have nine, six suited. 
we do have 9-8 suited, and we do have over pairs. But realize, the big blind in this scenario has a lot of combinations of two pairs and straights. So they have a nut advantage. And our range advantage in this spot is actually not that high either. So we lack the nut advantage, and we don't really have a range advantage. That means when we bet, we're usually going to be betting very polarized. That's going to be our best made hands and draws, like hands with a seven, like a seven suited, king seven suited. Because this is a spot where you we should very, very frequently expect to get raised or called. Okay? So if we're betting polarized here, what do we do with our junk? Well, what is junk here? Junk is going to be like ace two, king queen, pocket fours, etc. All these hands are just checking and giving up. Check it back. Give up if you fail to improve. Fine. Move on with your life, right? It is okay to just check and give up on boards that are not good for you. So many players get it in their heads that they have to fight for every pot. You can't win if you check. Well, realize uh, you don't have to win. A lot of people think that their identity is wrapped up in whether or not they win an individual poker pot, but it's not. I guess it is if you want it to be, but it does not have to be. Your identity should be wrapped up in if you make good, strong, high equity decisions at the poker table and in your life. Even then, sometimes you fail, though, and it is okay. Don't be too hard on yourself. Example three. You raise from under the gun and the button calls. Ooh, okay, so we're out of position now. If you look at GTO strategies from out of position, by the way, you're pretty much always going to be using mixed strategies from out of position, meaning sometimes you bet with hands, sometimes you check with the same hand, right? So you're mixing it up. Maybe a third of the time you bet, two-thirds of the time you check. You're also going to always want to mix in check raises in your out of position strategy. So... You can't just say, like, what do I do with all my garbage here? I check fold it every time. Maybe you do, maybe you don't. Maybe you do bet at some small frequency at the time. Maybe you do check raise at some small frequency at the time, especially if it has a backdoor flush draw and a gut shot or something like that. But we'll talk about what you mostly want to do with your total garbage here. So on the king-queen nine, you're going to be doing a decent amount of checking because even though you connect very well with the flop, notice we have all the nuts in our range, so does our opponent because they're calling on the button here, right? And they're not calling with total garbage on the button, presuming they're playing decently well. So this is a spot where their range is actually pretty good on this board. So we don't have much of a range advantage, and we don't have much of a nut advantage. When we lack the range advantage and we lack the nut advantage, we are going to be betting very polarized, right? Usually with our probably good top pairs and better, and even some of those probably want to put in a check raise. So this is a spot where we're not doing a lot of betting. And if we're not doing a lot of betting, it means we don't do much betting with our junk. Just checks and folds. So we raise under the gun and the button calls. Flop comes. King, eight, two. Okay, this is a cool spot where as you have more King X suited in your range, which is something you want to make sure you do have in your range if you're playing good, strong, fundamentally sound poker, consult the preflop charts at pokercoaching.com, please. In this spot, we have a lot of top pairs. And our opponent has some, but not a ton. So this is a spot where we should actually be betting pretty frequently using a small size with most of our range except for the total air balls that have little chance to improve like jack 10 type stuff. We also may want to check some middle pair sometimes, maybe some hands like pocket queen sometimes. So we're not checking with just only garbage, right? You want to make sure when you do check, you have some hands that can check call and then presumably check call down. But if you do have just total junk in the spot, it's probably okay to check it and then get out of the way like a hand with no backdoor flush draw and relatively few backdoor straight draws. So like Jack-10 of hearts here, it's probably okay just to check fold it. But if you told me you want to bet the Jack-10 of hearts here, I don't really mind it, even without a backdoor flush draw, because our range is pretty good and our opponents is going to have a lot of misses on this board. They're going to have a lot of random like Queen-Jack, Queen-10, stuff like that on this board. So this is a spot where I think we do get to get away with betting frequently and small. Now, if you don't raise King-7 suited preflop, well, then you have a bit of a problem, right? Because now we're just starting to miss more of the king X's. So definitely make sure you're playing good, strong GTO ranges, and this will be a pretty good board for you. Let's say we raise the cutoff and the button call. So now our range is much wider. King 8, 2, same spot, except for our range started wider. The neat thing about as it gets wider, we're going to actually contain more king X suits and king X offsuits. So I think this is still a pretty good spot for us where we still get to bet a pretty decent amount of the time. What about re-raise the cutoff and the button calls and the big blind calls? The flop comes jack, 10, 7. So we're playing three ways. Three ways, you're going to be betting pretty polarized most of the time. When you are out of position against anyone 
else in the pot. So say we raise button in the cutoff calls, we're out of position now. I'm sorry, we raise cutoff in the button calls. We're out of position now. Um, this is the spot where we're gonna be doing a decent amount of checking. So we're really not gonna be doing much betting with our junk at all. We're just getting out of the way, right? So check fold hands like pocket sixes, ace four, et cetera, et cetera. Now you may wanna bet with some gut shots here. Like say we did have king nine, that might be an okay hand to bet. Um, or a hand like king eight suited for a gut shot, that might be okay to bet. But we're not gonna be betting in this spot with just total garbage. With total garbage, multi-way, you're usually best just being done with it. Let's say you raise from the low jack and the cutoff and the button and the big blind call. Well, now we're gonna be checking pretty much everything besides our best made hands and our strong draws. Notice there's a flush draw available, so we have some really good flush draws we can bet. If we do check hands like middle pair and face a bet and a call, on this board, we should be getting out of the way. This is a spot a lot of people mess up. They stick around far too often. They do not realize that middle pair or bottom pair on a board where straights are already available and there's a bunch of flush draws available, uh, th this is a bad hand. They do not realize that this is a bad hand. So this is a spot where a lot of your hands are junk, especially when your opponent's defending ranges contain lots of sets, lots of straights, lots of two pairs, right? So you usually want to be getting out of the way in this spot with almost everything. Don't, don't, don't get stuck in one of these pots with a hand that is drawing to five outs. And if you do it, you're five outs. You could still very, very often lose. All right. So let's go back to it. What are the main things we need to be concerned with? Remember, our range. When we have a big range advantage and or a big nut advantage against our opponent's range, those are the times where you really do get to bet frequently. And as you are betting more and more and often, you get closer to 100% of hands. And as you get closer to 100% of hands, that's gonna include all of your total garbage. But if you're not betting with 100% of hands, naturally some of your total junk that has little chance to improve, those are gonna be put into your check back range. Now I do wanna say, if you do let it go check, check on the flop, and you have some garbage, then on the turn your opponent checks, some of these garbage hands you check back on the flop will become turn bluffs because a lot of your logical bluffs, your straight draws, your flush draws, whatever, a lot of those would have bet the flop, right? So therefore you don't have those in your turn range, which means if you don't have those in your turn range, well, we have to find some bluffs if we wanna be value betting anything. And that's often gonna be these total junk draws. So I wanna make it clear that, yeah, we're checking these back on the flop, but once the opponent shows passivity again by checking the flop and then checking the turn, that's when we are gonna start bluffing with some of this total garbage. So we're not just totally giving up. You gotta get after it. If some of these uh, ideas of bluffing are unfamiliar to you, please make sure you check out the tournament and cash game masterclasses at pokercoaching.com because we go through lots and lots and lots of GTO and implementable uh, situations to show you how to play these very, very low equity hands on the flop and the turn and the river. We analyze it substantially more over there. Also, your position's important, right? Out of position, you gotta do a lot more checking. Stack depth is important. Shallower stack, you gotta do a lot more checking. If your opponent's a calling station or a maniac, you got to do a lot more checking. And as there are more players in the pot, you have to do a lot more checking. So really, the only time you're betting your junk consistently is when you have the range advantage and or the nut advantage. When you are in great shape against one opponent, that's when you want to be getting after it. Otherwise, it's not your pot to win, and that's okay. That's going to be it for today. If you enjoyed this video, do me a favor, click the like and subscribe button below. I appreciate each and every one of you being here. If you have any comments, questions, suggestions, feedback, just want to say hi. Do that down in the comment section below. Good luck in your game. Have fun. And uh, well, just stop missing the flop and then all your problems will be solved.